Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining Southern Four Wheel Drive Association's uh, season two, episode one of our TechNet. We've uh, we've got a good good season planned. Uh, we're excited to be going live with you guys again. Um, just in case some of the thirty people who happen to be online right now, which that's an awesome number. Thank y'all. Uh, you know, we started this TechNet uh, before COVID-19, or actually when COVID-19 first started. Uh, we were doing face-to-face -face classroom education, and COVID caused us to shut things down. And we came up with this idea of doing live streams to deliver educational materials to our off-road community. Season one, we did 14 episodes. We had lots of guest speakers. We had people from uh, from Warren, BFG, TerraFlex, ARB. We, we just had lots of great guest speakers. And uh, so we're going to continue the same thing in this season. Uh, first thing we want to do tonight is I'm going to bring Jay Bird, the president of Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, on screen. And he's going to say a few words. Jay, all yours. All right. Hey, folks, Jay Bird here, the ice cream man, also president of the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. I am so happy that we have TechNet back. And guess what? I, he, Al didn't say it, but you saw it on the ad. Um, BFG is back as our basically our title sponsor. They are going to give away a another set of tires, which you can win at the upcoming Trail Fest I'll talk about. Um, and it's not one tire, it's not two tires, it's not three tires, it's not even four tires, it's a set of five tires. And um, <clears throat> Al and Mike will tell you all about it, and, and they'll tell you how, all you have to do is watch and comment when they tell you what to comment. And uh, so that's gonna, that's that's fabulous. But we can't forget Warren. I heard from a source that Warren is also gonna be giving away stuff throughout uh, the tech net as well. So with, that is, you know, so so Warren is there. <clears throat> Thank you to those two great um, companies that have, uh, have have embraced what uh, what we do. The other um, so upcoming couple things. Um, there there's a few things, some business stuff we got to take care of. The um, Southern Four Wheel Drive Association annual meeting. We normally have it, you know, in up near Windrock. But because of the spike in the virus, because, you know, all this kind of stuff, we can't really have it indoors because we normally get over 50 people. So I, I hate to do this, but we're going to have a Zoom meeting. Um, we, we've got the link already out, but we'll post it up again. It's going to be December 5th uh, at 9. We'll go over the Southern financials. We'll go over all the stuff that... Um, you know, we, we go over, we also vote and we've got a few open positions available. So if you're actually interested in and in, in helping out the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, um, let me see, I've got my list here. <clears throat> we need a secretary. We're looking for somebody to be in charge of communications. Uh, we need a director of conservation. That's a tough one. Business development, that's always a tough one. And then we're looking for uh, two coordinators, event coordinators, Trail Fest and Dixie Run. Um, I don't think that you're going to be able to take the uh, position of director of education away from Al. So don't, what? don't even try. Don't even try. Okay. Um, last two things, mark it on your calendar, get ready. Um, Trail Fest is going to be April 30th to May 2nd at AOP. It's going to be fabulous. So go ahead and ask for your vacation days now. Get it down there. We are going to have it. <clears throat> it's got AOP in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. And you can win a set of tires just by watching this episode. Speaking of dates, Dixie Run. Once again, we're going to be back at the best park, Winrock. And that's going to be October 1st through 3rd. Go ahead and get that on your calendar now. We've got it on your calendar. So... Thank you so much. Thank you, Al, Mike. I can't wait to hear what we have uh, in store today. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Al, and I'm going to just sit and listen. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jay. Thanks a lot. Um, 
We have we have Mike Morrison. I'm gonna bring Mike on the screen now. I hope. Hey, how's it hey, going? Hello. What's up, Facebook world? Okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about season two, Mike. Uh, I, I I briefly said that we're we're getting season two started. Uh, this is episode one. We're going to continue basically the same format that we uh, that we did in season one. Um, what what do you, what are you going to take us through? The next uh, the next few episodes. So the next few episodes, we are going to be focused on kind of uh, field repairs and tools uh, that we use to work on our Jeep or Toyotas or whatever our off road vehicle may be. Um, so we're going to talk uh, tonight. We're going to talk kind of about some of the con common problems that we experience on trails and maybe some of the tools we should carry to fix those problems and. Um, you know, I'll show you a little bit about what I carry in my tool bag, but everybody's is going to be a little bit different. And then next episodes where it's going to be just super cool because we've actually got the tool guys coming in to tell us all about tools. And they're really going to teach us a lot. I'm excited about that because who knew that there was a ton of science that went into making tools and making quality tools that hold up to our type of abusive work that we do on them kind of in the field. And then the final episode for this season, we're going to, we're going to kind of break it up into different seasons, but the final episode for this one, this particular season, we are actually going to demonstrate some common field repairs um, that I've learned over the years in the field. Uh, things like how to repair your radiator. If uh, you get a hole in it or it starts leaking, how to repair coolant hoses or, no start diagnosis when your vehicle won't start things like that so i'm really excited this is this is a phenomenal topic um so it should be super exciting uh, and it's always cool to hear kind of what other people experience too so remember guys in the comments if you got a question or you have an experience throw it in there so that we can hear hear all about it well jay jay mentioned that we that, that warren was helping us out let me let me uh let me show folks something we got this, Warren has provided us this uh, roll bar grab handles. It's out of their epic line of, of things. It's very sturdy. Uh, it's just a grab handle. You you guys know what you say when you reach up to grab that grab handle. So uh, here's what we're going to do. Anybody that comments tonight is going to be eligible going to a drawing for this weekly prize. So what we'll do, you guys comment. We'll, we'll print out your list of names. What we do is we print them out in the order that they're received. Uh, any duplicates are thrown out. You only get one change per, per show. Um, and then we'll use a random number generator. To pick a number, we'll go down the list. And if it picks 36, the 36th person that made a comment is the one that win, wins these. I'll contact you, get your address, and we'll ship them off to you within, within just a little while. We're gonna do that weekly. Um, right up until Trail Fest. We, we plan to do uh, uh, these episodes of our tech net uh, periodically, uh, probably about two a month. We found last season that doing one a week was sort of taxing on me and Mike. We're sort of lazy. So I think <laughs> going forward, we're not going to do try to do one a week. There may be times when it makes sense to do back to back per week. But um, mostly it's going to be a couple of times per month. Uh, we're going to stick to Thursday night. And we did it. Uh, we're doing it at eight o'clock this season. I put a poll out on Facebook. Many of you saw that. And the overwhelming majority of people wanted to do it at eight Eastern time instead of seven. Uh, so, so here we are. We're going to stick with that unless somebody convinces us that it's a bad time and we should do it some other time. Um, what else? If you have a question, I might even send you a special little prize if you can stump Mike with a question tonight. Okay, it has to be on topic, but uh, but we are uh, preface your question in the comments with a capital Q. Only reason I ask you to do that, it just makes it easy for us to scroll through the list and find the questions. We'll probably hold all questions till the end just because there's some latency, some delay in this live stream, and it causes problems if we try to answer questions as 
as we go. Mike will already be off on another subject and your question will pop up on the previous subject. So we'll hold those questions to the end. Uh, and somewhere along the way, I'm gonna scroll a message across the bottom of the screen. It tells you what you need to comment, what phrase you need to put in comments to be eligible to win a set of BFG tires. Jay's already talked about that. Five uh, KO2s or KM3s up to 37 inches. Um, BFG is just a great sponsor and they're on board um, with Southern. They'll be helping us at Trail Fest. They'll be helping us again at Dixie Run. So, uh, so thank you, BFG. You guys, go tell your BFG rep or salesman or whatever, thank you for helping Southern. Even if you do have a different brand tire on your Jeep or vehicle, okay? Mike, you want to take it from here? You want to tell us, take just a minute and tell us about Morrison Outdoor Adventures, and then we'll jump right into it for the 42 people that are watching right now. So um, my wife and I run a company called Morrison's Outdoor Adventures. We provide uh, four-wheel drive training and recovery training. Um, I've been a four-wheel drive trainer for about nine years now, training military, commercial groups, as well as uh, recreational groups in proper off-road driving and recovery. Um, so that's what we do. We offer classes, group classes, as well as private trainings. Um, so you can go to our Facebook page, Morrison's Outdoor Adventures, or go to our website, www.morrisonsoutdooradventures.com and uh, see what our schedule is and see when the next time we are offering a class in your area. Um, and we would love to have you there. When we go to the Southern Four Wheel Drive events, we also offer uh, free training there. Uh, we had tons of interest in that, so hopefully at Trail Fest we can get something going with that as well. Um, but we offer just a ton of different classes, whether it's recovery, even full field expedient repair classes, and we offer a level one, two, and three uh, off-road driving class, which are a lot of fun. Um, and we periodically do trail rides um, kind of throughout the southeast. But that's a little bit about us. Um, make sure, guys, that with all the tech nets right you know what you got to do once this tech net is over make sure you like it share it tell your mom dad aunt uncle dogs hairdresser your veterinarian your dentist you know whoever you got to tell your doctor but let's help get the word out about southern four wheel drive and what it's about and um help them spread the good word right so let's get in oh and make sure you guys do uh send a message to bfg if you don't like their facebook page give it a like same thing with warren uh like their facebook and instagram and send them a message and thank them for supporting southern four wheel drive association all right so let's get into um what's in your toolbox to kind of start that off let's talk about some of the common problems we see off-road really ultimately when we're driving our off-road vehicles we need them if we break it down into uh, systems that they need to operate and function correctly we need them to be able to start. So we need to be able to crank the vehicle, right? So when we think about cranking the vehicle, you know, the starter, what's a vehicle need to start? It needs air, fuel, fire, right? The next step is we need to be able to keep that vehicle running once it cranks. So it needs a good charging system. It needs uh, to be able to cool itself in order to stay running. Uh, it also needs to get fuel to continue running as well. After that, we've got to be able to get this vehicle to roll. So you've got to have tires, you know, fixing a flat tire is part of field expedient repair. Your axle shafts that could possibly break. Uh, problems with transmissions, problems with uh, U-joints, things like that are all things that could hurt us in rolling off-road. After that, we need to be able to steer this vehicle. And, you know, there's, there's different types of steering out, steering systems on vehicles out there. But there certainly are some field expedient repairs that we can make to be able to steer our vehicle and of course power steering right we want to be able to continue turning our vehicle easily once we get those big huge 37 inch bfg km3s on there right um, so being able to steer it with power steering is a big thing and then finally we've got to be able to stop so we need our brakes and brakes is another area where they receive a lot of abuse and we can see some issues off road so let's talk a little bit about starting a vehicle right or cranking a vehicle up typically when we get into the vehicle and we turn the key right 
And when we turn that key, the noise a vehicle makes or no noise at all can tell us a little bit about where to start with our no start diagnosis. If we turn the key and the vehicle does nothing, no lights on the dashboard come up, or we turn the key and we just get that click, 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 typically we're looking at having a problem with our battery, which is one of the most common no start issues, right? We don't think much about our battery. Hey, I just bought a new one. I had it installed or I installed it. Um, so now it's under the hood and it's good to go. I don't need to worry about it. Well, there are some maintenance items that go into a battery that can make it work out for us. Okay. So going in, making sure our battery terminals are clean, remembering that our alternators, we're running our lights, our radios, maybe our winch and everything. So if we don't have a good connection back onto the battery, we may not be getting a good charge or the battery may not be able to crank the vehicle because of a bad connection. So cleaning our battery terminals and tightening it. So having a the proper set of wrenches for um, servicing your battery terminals, right? If you got a Toyota, it's a 10, a 12 um, millimeter, or if you've got a Jeep, like a half inch or a 9 16 uh, wrench to be able to tighten up the lugs on your battery. Um, if your battery dies, having some form of way to jump the vehicle off. Uh, whether it's jumper cables, if you're in a group, or now there's these nice little portable battery packs where you can jump yourself off, and they're relatively small, and they work very well. Um, some of the various brands are out there. There's a Red Arc one. There's also the Genus NoCo ones that work extremely well, and they are designed for different size motors, even now up to big diesel motors like on your tow rigs, right? So you can use these to jump yourself off and then you recharge it um, and store it back in your vehicle. So those are great things to carry if you have an issue with starting your vehicle. But when we think about, you know, if the battery's good, what does it take to start the, the, the vehicle? Well, it needs air, right? It needs fuel. So we've got to be making sure we're getting fuel to the motor. And then we've got to have some form of fire, which is typically coming from the, from the battery, right? going through the ignition system into the vehicle. So if we are testing um, the kind of the no start diagnosis, one of the easiest things to check is air, right? If you've been driving in a dusty environment, maybe your air filters gotten clogged up, or I've seen this happen before, you know, rats got in there and built a nest when, you're, when your off-road rig was sitting in the barn at home and you didn't notice it. So we can easily check the air filter to make sure it's clean. OK, make sure that it's clean, make sure our motor's breathing good. But with a lot of newer vehicles, it's probably going to throw a check engine light if you're having problems with airflow because we have a mass airflow sensor on there. Um, but having the proper tools to access your um, air filter, super important. If you have a dirty air filter, maybe it got clogged up with a lot of dust. You can easily take it out. Most of us have onboard air compressors on our vehicles and you can blow out that uh, that air filter. Just make sure that you don't that you blow the opposite direction the air would flow. You don't necessarily want to force the dirt through the air filter and open up the filter even more. So we want to blow backwards to blow all that dirt off. A simple trick is uh, if you're in a dusty environment, taking a pair of pantyhose, right? Carrying pantyhose off road, put it over your air filter as a pre cleaner. That way, when you get to camp or you get done wheeling for the day, you can just pull those pantyhose off, throw them away, and your air filter is still going to be nice and clean. You don't have that dust on there. So the next one, let's talk a little bit about fuel, okay? Used to be that you had a sort of a valve, a Schrader valve that you could test fuel pressure with, but most newer vehicles now are direct injection. They're really high PSI, and we're not going to carry specialized mechanics tools to check for fuel pressure uh, at our motor. But most of the time with most of our vehicles, we can hear those fuel pumps to tell if they're pushing fuel pressure. When we turn the key to the accessory position, getting ready to crank it, but not actually turning it over, if you listen, a lot of times you can hear a hum from your fuel pump because it's got to pressurize the fuel system. So it goes to um, kind of a higher uh, uh, pressure, uh, kind of a higher voltage to push that pressure through. You can even open up the door to your gas tank and take the cap off and while someone, someone turns the keys and listen to see if you hear it kicking on. Um, if we don't hear it kicking on, then we might not have fuel pressure. And carry a hammer, right? Stick with me here, but carry a hammer 
because it's hard to really access a fuel pump. But if you sometimes take a hammer in on the bottom of your gas tank, not like a metal big hammer, but like a dead blow hammer and give it a couple of good whacks, not enough to dent it, but a couple of good whacks on the bottom of the gas tank, it may kind of knock that fuel pump loose and get it to start working again enough to get you off the trail. Most of the time, our fuel pumps don't just fail. Normally, they give us some indicators, like we're driving along, the vehicle shuts off while it's hot, but once it cools down, it cranks up and runs again because the fuel pump's on its way out, or a relay that controls the fuel pumps on its way out. So kind of go towards, talk a little bit about fire. Um, now it's harder to test if our vehicle is actually getting fire because now we may not even have spark plugs. We may have coil packs or something like that that is what's giving the fire in the motor. Um, but if we've got good connection at our battery going through our ignition system, most likely we're getting pretty good fire um, through the engine. Um, so as long as we have the air fuel mixture going into the motor, then we're going to get some type of spark to crank the vehicle. But old school vehicles, you could pull a spark plug and, you know, hold it against the metal and look for that arc to see if you were getting some type of arc. So having um, a specific socket for your spark plugs, normally they have a little rubber boot in there so that when you unscrew uh, your spark plug and go to pull it out, so when you pull it out, it's going to hold that spark plug in the socket. Um, so that makes it really easy uh, to get the spark plugs out because we all know in our newer vehicles, the ones that do have spark plugs, they are hard to reach, right? Very hard to reach. So um, normally I'll carry a couple of extensions and a nice ratchet to be able to get back there to those as well. So that's our air fuel fire, right? And if your fuel pump does come back, go bad one tip or one trick I have used before is I will actually take my air compressor and I will pressurize the fuel tank to push fuel through um, enough to get me off the trail. Um, it does work, but it's kind of a pain to do. Um, all right. So we get our vehicle, our vehicle crank, but we can't get it to keep running, right? So what are some things our vehicle needs to keep running? With that, We've got charging, right? Our alternator has to keep our vehicle charged because our battery, or especially on these newer vehicles, our battery is is kind of just like a an in-between between the alternator and the vehicle. But the alternator can't keep the vehicle running because there's so many computers and body control modules and things wired into our vehicles now that they need that voltage from the battery. Um, and they, you know, extremely complex electrical systems on newer vehicles. So we need charging alternators um, so we have to make sure that our alternator is putting out the correct the correct voltage normally somewhere between you know 13.2 volts upwards of you know 13.8 volts unless you've done some type of modification like uh, red art dual battery system which bumps it up to like 14.6 volts so we can test that with a multimeter on the back of our alternator um, and a ground right um, so using a multimeter, that's another big tool that I carry, but I can see what the output of the alternator is. And that will tell me somewhere in the general range of whether or not my alternator is good or bad. If I pull, if I pull those numbers with my multimeter and I see the alternator is only, only putting out 12.1 volts, then I know that that alternator is starting to fail. It's not charging that battery enough to keep the vehicle running. Older vehicles, you could crank the vehicle and take the battery out and it would continue running. Right. You might not be able to run your lights, but once the vehicle was cranked, it didn't need that battery to keep going. But that was older vehicles, new ones. You can't do that. So what do you do if your alternator fails? Well, hopefully, you know, you did not. Go out by yourself, right? You went out with friends. So now you've got a vehicle that has a good battery and a good alternator. OK, what you do is you park both vehicles side by side. On the vehicle that has the bad alternator with the dead battery, you pull that battery out. Then you take it over to the good vehicle that has a good alternator and the good battery. You disconnect and pull the good battery out and put the bad battery right back in and reconnect it. Right. Be cautious because some vehicles, they won't run very long once you pull that battery out. Now you've got that dead battery in there and that alternator starts charging it. So you can take the good charge battery and put it in your vehicle. And now you can make all your connections. So having really good tools that makes this job easy can save you a lot of time and headache. Because if you're doing this to get off the trail, 
you're going to do this a couple times because once you put that good battery, that charge battery into the vehicle that won't charge it, you're not going to get, but maybe, maybe up to an hour out of it if possible. Um, so we have to make sure we turn off all of our electronics, our lights, our radios, you know, LED light bars, all that stuff, anything that's going to, that we can, that's going to draw out of that battery. So we drive until the vehicle shuts off again and we swap them again, right? That good alternator is charging that battery for us. If you can, uh, if you have multiple vehicles in the convoy, say three or four, try not to do it with the same vehicle over and over because now we're taxing. We are taxing that, um, that alternator on that good charging system a lot. So we could wear it out. So just be cautious about that. Um, I have done this three or four times before uh, trying to get a vehicle home. So we actually did do it um, on the road home. And um, the other alternator about a week later died on us. So we ended up replacing that one too. So it is very taxing to it, but that's your charging system. So what else does a vehicle need to continue running and operating? It needs to be able to cool, right? If we can't keep a vehicle cool or at operating temperature, it's gonna overheat. And this is very common in the off-road world because we get all kinds of dust and dirt and grime um, in, uh, in the radiator and it doesn't get good airflow or it can't cool efficiently and our vehicle overheats. That we're moving at very slow speeds off-road. So we don't have a lot of airflow through that, through that radiator. So if we wanna keep the vehicle cooling or let's back up, let's say we're driving down the trail and we see the vehicle overheat. OK, temp gauge starts rate rising up. So we see the temps are getting higher. First thing we should do, and this is completely counterintuitive, but the first thing we should do is not shut the vehicle down. Right. Most people want to immediately turn the vehicle off. But if we shut it down, it actually gets hotter before it starts cooling off. So the very first thing we want to do is, is turn the heat on full blast. Right. Turn the heat on full blast because we have a heater core that's like a second radiator and so when we open that up to the uh to the heater core now coolant has to circulate through that second radiator and it helps draw more heat off and it will help drop that heat so we don't shut the vehicle down we turn the heat on full blast and we get out of the vehicle and pop the hood so that we can start to look if we see it's gushing cooling out yeah, you're going to have to shut the vehicle down or it's going to continue to to kind of push cooling out. But if we can't, if if it's not gushing fluid, keep it running, right? That's why it's always important after you've been off-roading, especially if you've been in a lot of mud or dust or wet conditions, wash your radiator out, clean it, right? But we have to be able to keep the vehicle cool. Another thing that can happen is our thermostat can get stuck uh, in the closed position. So having the right tools to take that thermostat out, and it's different for every vehicle. You know, obviously, if you have a Jeep, having a good set of standard sockets will help you do this, or standard box-in wrenches. Or if you've got a Toyota, you've got to have metric, right? So with that, you may have to remove that thermostat and take it out if it got frozen shut. So that's kind of a little bit brief description of cooling the vehicle. What about keeping the vehicle rolling, right? And this is this is one we could go all day at, but I'm gonna hit some of the common ones. Um, first off, if we wanna keep it rolling, we gotta keep the tires inflated, right? So tire repair is a big part of what we have to do on the trail. We've done some tire repair on here. We'll go more in depth into tire repair on the last TechNet of the series, the third, the third iteration right before Christmas. But if you've gotta take your tire off, and then put a spare on, or if you've got to take the tire off to make a repair and put it back on. Most of us, our common thought process when we put it on is to tighten those lug nuts down as tight as we can. We call them ugga duggas, right? I'm gonna give it one more ugga dugga, tighten it down a little bit more. But we have to be cautious because we can over tighten those lug nuts and actually stretch the threads out on our lugs. And this can cause them to go come loose when we go off down the road when and when we're going down the road and we can lose a tire going down the road. So torque those lug nuts to spec, right? Every you know type of wheel out there kind of has a torque spec with it. Make sure you torque those lug nuts down. How do you do that? You have a torque wrench, right? Torque wrench is a good tool to carry uh, for those instances. 
because it'll limit the amount of pressure that you can put on that lug nut to whatever the torque setting is. And I'm not going to go too in-depth with that because we've got some cool tool guys coming in next week that are going to tell us a lot about torque wrenches. But it's a great tool to have in your shop, too. If you rotate your own tires, then you can torque your uh, lug nuts down to the correct torque specs. After that, axle shafts and things like that, we, a lot of us that have run big tires, you know, Jeeps, done a lot of rock crawling, we've broken an axle shaft, right? And had to pull that axle shaft or sheared off a U joint on a on a Jeep or a drive shaft even. So having a good set of tools that match those good set of sockets and open end wrenches that can help us get those off, uh, we know that that's an in depth job and um, it's going to take a little while to get them fixed. Or if we have a spare, or just to be able to drive the vehicle out, being able to remove those if we can, depending on whether it's a full float or semi float axle is is a job having the right tools is definitely going to help us all right so that's briefly about rolling i'm not really going to go too much into into transmissions and stuff like that tonight but the next step is we've got to be able to steer the vehicle right what goes into steering we turn the steering wheel and the tires go this way and then we turn the steering wheel and the tires go this way right so there's different setups if you've got an independent front suspension you've got what they call a um, rack and pinion style steering if you've got like a jeep you've got what they call a recirculating ball style steering so with that tie rod ends are a common failure off-road especially with ifs vehicles independent front suspension excuse me because these are the fusible links on the steering mechanism or the front end for ifs trucks Solid axle, they're a little bit stronger, but we can still damage them. Also, with a solid axle vehicle, we have that long tie rod out there that we could bend if we're not careful. So, having some tools to either replace a tie rod, which is very easy to replace off road, to if they shear off, and having the replacement parts a good thing to help us kind of stay in the steering game. Power steering is a little bit different. With power steering, we've got a lot of pressure moving through and we've got a power steering pump. If the power steering pump goes out, there's not a lot that we can do. But if uh, we start to lose fluid, we can find a leak. And if we carry like the uh, silicone tape and a bike inner tube that I showed in our FER kit uh, earlier in season one, you can patch up some of the rubber hoses, even some of the metal hoses to stem the loss of fluid or carrying a replacement hose if you need to, because typically it's the rubber hoses that fail. Um, a lot of times when we put bigger tires on our rigs, if we don't upgrade the steering or the power steering, we can do what we call boiling the power steering fluid and we overheat it and it starts to kind of gush out, right? Start to gush out pretty bad. So um, some of the things that uh, we might want to know is what runs our power steering pump. Well, on newer vehicles, it's the same thing that runs our alternator, our water pump, and all that. It's one continuous belt called a serpentine belt. And there is not really a field expedient repair fix if your serpentine belt goes out. Um, the old style V belts where we had multiple belts, there is these adjustable V belts that you can carry. But I've tried pantyhose. I've tried all kinds of stuff with a serpentine belt, and I've never had a whole lot of luck keeping it going. So with a serpentine belt what i typically do is is i inspect it before i go out in the vehicle if i see dry rotter cracking because it's rubber or if it looks like it's starting to wear out then i will replace it with a new one and carry the old one as a spare inside the vehicle just in case it fails um, if it fails and it breaks and you don't have a replacement you're dead in the water because none of the parts of your vehicle are going to work together without that serpentine belt turning everything so carrying a replacement one of those and you are going to need um, some serious tools to be able to swap that out, right? You're going to need a long breaker bar with the right socket to loosen the tensioner uh, pulley and things like that. Um, and what I also do is, is so I don't forget what uh, the routing for my serpentine belt around all those pulleys is, is I take a picture and I keep it on my phone uh, so that I can easily refer back to it. Older vehicles, they normally had a little picture under the hood that you could see and um, it would tell you the routing, but newer manufacturers don't want us to necessarily touch under the hoods of our vehicles, so they don't put that picture under there anymore. So take a picture of it with your phone so you know how to route it back before 
it breaks on you. And that's a that's an easy kind of trick that you can do. Um, you can Google it, but we're not always somewhere where we have good service, right? All right. So um, that's steering, right? Now let's move into stopping the vehicle. So if we've got to stop the vehicle, you know, we can gear down. If we're in a manual transmission, even an automatic, we can gear down, but that's not going to bring us to a stop. We could nudge it up against a tree, but that's not very tread lightly, right? Um, if we have to, we could in a pinch, but we'd rather find a better way. Well, with our brake systems, basically the way it works is you have a master cylinder under the hood. Um, from that, you're going to have lines running out to either an ABS block if it's a newer vehicle or they're going to run straight out of the master cylinder down to the tires if it's an older vehicle without ABS, um, anti-lock brake system. But either way, you can trace the braking system down to each tire. That's typically where we're going to see, um, see failures, right, is down at the tires. The brake lines are going to burst. Normally, it's a hard line for the most part from the ABS block or the master cylinder down to along the frame. But when it splits off the frame to go down to the tires, it's flexible hose so that our suspensions can flex up and down. And this is where they can fail. If it fails, a good pair of vice grips, um, kind of needle nose vice grips is a good thing to carry because we can pinch off that brake line if it's at the soft portion, uh, the flexible hose, so that we can now build pressure back up in our brake system. So being able to build pressure back up in our brake system very important because that's how our braking works. Now, what's the downside to this, right? Is now we've got whatever brake we've cut off isn't working anymore. So if it's on the front of the vehicle and we go to hit the brakes, whichever tire is braking is the vehicle is going to pull in that direction, right? If we if we cut out the brake on the passenger side, so we only have one good brake on the driver's side, when we hit the brakes, it's going to pull sharp to the driver's side. We don't feel that as much in the rear of the vehicle. Um, but certainly feel it in the front. So if we start to have a leak anywhere in the system, we can kind of cut that out by pinching off the line. If it's a hard line, um, you can't necessarily pinch it with a pair of vice grips because it's pretty, pretty hard. But if it's leaking in a hard line, what you can do is cut it off and take a hammer, pound it flat, and then take your needle nose pliers and roll it back and take a little gob of JB Weld and close that off, quick weld so that it solidifies in about five minutes. Once it solidifies, now you've just canceled off wherever that hard line was going. You're gonna have to replace it later, but it was already broken and leaking. So you can at least build up brake pressure again. And also carrying a little bit of brake fluid is a good idea just in case, because it does take a little bit to notice that your brakes are going out. Um, you know, once that pedal goes all the way to the floor, you probably already lost a little bit of fluid. So, you know, making sure that you carry the correct brake fluid because they have what they call DOT3, DOT4, DOT5. Um, so if we have a DOT3 vehicle, we can use DOT4 and 5 in it. But if we have a vehicle that requires the dot four, dot five, we can't use three. So keep that in mind. Um, and also remember, None of us really do this, but we should be flushing out our brake systems at least once a year to get that old brake fluid out and all the dirt and grime because that's a sealed system and it will help your brakes work much better. All right. So that's just a brief overview of kind of the common problems we see. You know, we could go for the next eight hours and still not cover all the stuff we could see off road. But these are just some of the common problems that we can fix. Let's talk a little bit about toolkits and what we carry in our toolkits. And I've got mine here with me. So last time we kind of covered a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the weird stuff that I carry. But now let's kind of talk about the types of tools and stuff that I carry. And don't laugh at my tools. You see a lot of use, so they're rusty and beat up. But um, I carry them for specific reasons, right? So, and mine are more tailored towards um, Toyotas because uh, that's what I deal with in my trainings a lot. But again, you can tailor it towards Jeeps by knowing what tools you should carry. Stay tuned, because we'll probably learn that in a later episode. But I carry a nice pair of uh, snap ring pliers with uh, tips that I can switch out so that I can remove snap rings without having them fly at me and hit me in the eye or the face. 
I also carry uh, two different, I carry this pair of wire strippers, a small pair for areas where it's hard for me to get in, but I also carry a big set of wire strippers that will handle larger wire to kind of strip it back if I've got to make a replacement or make some changes in electrical system. And then I carry, this right here is a large set of crimpers for crimping different butt connectors or new terminal ends for the battery, things like that, um, to kind of put it back together. The next thing I carry is uh, this brush right here, a good metal bristled brush for cleaning kind of dirty battery terminals or things like that because, you know, they get corroded, they um, are kind of oxidized, so we've got to clean those up. Wait a minute, carry, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have y'all noticed Mike sporting that new beard? I think he uses that brush on his beard, y'all. I do, I do. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's getting winter time. I got to stay warm. I live in a camper. It's cold. <laughs> all right. So I will carry um, a good set of screwdrivers. Some people can get away with carrying one screwdriver with multiple tips. I don't. Um, I carry a good set of screwdrivers with magnetic tips uh, to kind of help me out, both Phillips and Flathead. Um, we don't see much with Flathead, but these work really well for removing some of those pesky plastic uh, fasteners on some of the uh, vehicles, the newer vehicles, especially now. Uh, so we can use these to kind of get it out of the way. And every once in a while, you have a bolt or a, a screw that's got a Flathead on it. But the for me, the magnetic tips are super important and I'll carry, you know, even ones that have a whole lot longer shank to them um, so I can get reach into kind of tight places. If I've got a hose clamp, that's a pain to get to. A long handle Phillips screwdriver is super key and kind of getting in there and reaching into the tight places. So um, right here is uh, for my vehicle, it is a uh, spark plug. You can't really see on video, but there is a little rubber uh, boot in there that goes over top of the spark plug. So when I loosen it and I pull the spark plug out, it holds it in place in that rubber boot in there and makes it really easy um, to get it out. And I don't have to try to reach my hand down in there and try and pop it out. But uh, with this, um, make sure you got the right size if it's your spark plugs, right? So I know with the specific vehicle that I work with, the 13 16 that I've got right here is, is what I need most of the time. Um, and sometimes, depending on the vehicles that I'm training, I will carry the right size for that vehicle. Um, so, kind of next on the list is I carry a good pair of channel locks, right? I'll normally carry a big pair like this. And um, if I can find them, I'll normally carry a small pair as well. Uh, but it's hidden from me right now. So, a pair of channel locks are great because you can adjust them to a bigger size if you've got a big bolt you've got to get to, or you've got to hold something in place and hold it tight. So carrying these channel locks because they are adjustable on this side as you move it up and down and in and out of these channels is invaluable. If you do a lot with independent front suspension uh, vehicles, when you break a CV axle, the nut you have to get off is like a 36 millimeter on some of those vehicles. So, you know, that's a hard one. Uh, to carry a socket for, right? It's a big bulky socket. Plus it's a single use item. It only does that, but you can get it off with channel locks. All right, next I carry a couple of different sizes of pry bars right here. I carry a short one and I carry a longer one so that if I've got to get uh, a little bit more ugga duggas when I'm prying something out, I can do that with my pry bar. And I always get ones that have the metal ends on them so I can also use this kind of as a chisel if I need to. Um, to pop something loose, like a uh, pesky tie rod in that won't come out. Uh, these work great for. I carry a short one because um, Toyota Tacomas have drum brakes in the rear with self adjusters. And when mud gets in those, they are really hard. They don't adjust very well. So when they don't adjust, they aren't breaking. So I will use this to reach in the back of them and adjust that adjuster on there. And even older vehicles that had drum brakes, these work great for. But this is just the perfect size to get in there um, and make that adjustment without hitting the leaf spring or coil spring or whatever's in the way. So I carry a couple of different size pry bars um, that I need. So let me flip my bag around right here. 
so I can get to the back side. But I will carry, for me, I carry box in wrenches and I carry standard and metric, right? Um, and what I mean by that standard, like a five eighths, is uh, what you're going to see like being used on Jeeps, Fords, Dodges, things like that, where uh, this is a 15 millimeter. It's close, but it's not quite exact. But this is going to be more your foreign vehicles like Toyota Tacomas, Toyota vehicles, almost all metric. I also don't carry every single size because um, for me, especially with Toyotas, I know that I need a 10 millimeter, I need a 12 millimeter, a 15 millimeter, a 17 and a 19 millimeter for most everything I'm going to run into. So I don't have to start all the way down at four or five and go all the way up to 22 or 24 because that's a lot of extra weight to carry. Um, and it does allow me to carry both standard and metric um, so that when I'm training multiple vehicles. So kind of learning um, what sizes are prevalent on your vehicle, carry those specific sizes. But a good set of box in wrenches is super invaluable. You can get them with ratcheting ends um, so that you don't have to pull it off every time and put it on. Um, I don't carry those because they tend to get dust and dirt and grime in them unless you have a really good set, right? But they can be expensive. Um, and we're going to have, again, some tool guys next week that are going to teach us about some of these. But I do carry that kind of that complete set. One of the other things I carry is um, these these vice grips right here. These are adjustable um, so that you when you clamp them down, they lock into place. So you adjust them to the sides. This is what I use for clamping off brake lines. Um, I also will carry a needle nose pair that's flat right here um, to clamp off stuff really well. Um, a good set of these is super, super invaluable off-road because if you can't get to um, a bolt necessarily with your boxing wrench or something, or maybe you just need to hold the other side of the bolt, you can clamp these down on there and it will hold it in place. Um, so I carry a couple different sizes of these. And then kind of the last things I'll carry, uh, if I can pull any out here, but they're kind of deep in, is I'll carry a, a couple of chisels, um, a brass drift, and a, a punch. I can't get them out right now because they're, they're, <laughs> they're way in there. My fingers are too big. But I will carry those items in my toolkit. And those are just some common items. Some of us uh, will carry you know, a lot more in our toolkits. For me, this is what I consider a field expedient repair kit, meaning that this is something to make a very quick repair to get me off the trail. Um, you can get as in-depth with your toolkit as you want to, to carry even more stuff. Um, and depending on how long I'm going out, if I'm going out on a trail, uh, on a long two or three day trip, right? An overland trip, then I will probably carry more tools. I might even carry a full socket set. Um, but if I'm just going out for the day, I'm gonna carry just my small field expedient or kit. And my goal there is to keep it as light as possible. Um, but those are just some of the tools I carry. You can you know, carry impact wrenches because there's awesome battery operated impact wrenches out there. Um, you know, You can carry drills, impact drills, all kinds of stuff now. And they're great tools to carry. Um, just be conscious, right? The more weight we add to our vehicle, the more stuff we're having to carry around. So I try to keep mine as light as possible. Um, but guys, that's kind of a quick intro to field expedient repair and my toolkit. Um, so Al, uh, if you want to jump back in, but guys, if you have some ideas for us for up and coming future seasons for our tech nets, let us know. Um, let us know what you guys want to see this next th uh, after this one. Then two next episodes are all going to be about tools and field expedient repair. And then after Christmas, when we start kind of our next season of putting this together, we'd love to know what you guys would like to see more of. Is it recovery? Is it, you know, driving stuff? What do you want to know more about? More about overlanding? I know from the first set of tech nets, you guys love watching Dan Greck. Uh, talk. That was one of our best tech nets. I know you guys really like seeing the BF Goodrich one. So um, let us know what you guys want to see. And I think Al has some questions for us. I, well, our viewers have some questions for us. The first question, are you ready? 
what should the fuel pressure be in a new Jeep? Um, so I don't know the exact pressure of the new Jeep. I know with direct injection systems um, that they can be in the thousands of PSI. Um, so that's why we can't necessarily test these new direct injection style systems uh, because the PSI is so high um, that it's it's impossible without specific tools to kind of test that fuel pressure. I don't know exactly what fuel injection system a Jeep, the new Jeep uh, JLs run or even the JKs. So I don't I'm not completely sure what the fuel pressure should be. How how about a how about an older vehicle that that's carbureted? Uh, it, Four or five psi. Uh, I think it would probably be more than that. Um, all vehicles kind of require and different style motors require different psi fuel okay. pressure. So it's it's hard kind of to know exactly what psi they're running at. Okay. And that's out, that's outside. I of kind of um my realm of what i know so that would be a question that stumped me stumps me a little bit well it's uh a little bit okay so the next question which i can answer but uh says what should the volt meter read uh this was i forgot who asked the question but they said it, theirs was reading 14 to 15 volts all the time and i know that um if your engine's running you're going to be anywhere from 13.7 to 14 and a half volts charging the battery. So if your yeah. engine's running, you're going to be up there at 14, 14 and a half volts all the time. Um, if you turn your engine off and you let the uh, you, you let let the battery settle a little while, uh, say 30 minutes, and then read it. You're probably going to read somewhere around 12.7 to 12.8 volts because that battery is going to settle back down, and that's where it's going to stay until you discharge it. Uh, yep. In, in some way. So. Yeah. How and close was that? That that was very close. You know, depending on the vehicle, Toyotas normally like to be somewhere around 13.6 to 13.8. Um, there are modifications you can do to the alternator to get it to pump up to 14 and a half. Um, that's very popular in the overland world, but you're right. You know, once that battery settles back down, if you're testing at the battery, it's going to be somewhere around, you know, that 12 and a half volts, 12.8 volts, somewhere around there. Um, you know, be cautious. Some of us run, you know, voltmeters inside our vehicles. There is going to be voltage drop in that wire that runs to, um, whatever your voltage meter is. So it may not be a true reading. We really like to see it either at the alternator if we're testing the charging system or at the battery if we're testing the battery. Also, um, it used to be that our alternators put out voltage based on our RPMs, right? The faster the motor turns, the more uh, voltage our alternators would put out. That's not true so much anymore. Most newer vehicles put out enough voltage based on the requirement of the vehicle regardless of rpm so more rpms doesn't necessarily mean more voltage on newer vehicles yeah those older vehicles had generators and not alternators so the, the, the generators yeah. the voltage was proportional to this rpms like you said good yeah that was okay. before my time <laughs> Here's a, here, here. oh hush jay I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna bring jay back on screen so he could answer that in just a minute okay Okay, here's another one. I want to I want to try to answer, and I want you to correct me. But Scott wanted to know. Uh, Scott Pope wanted to know what can what causes his automatic transmission to overheat. I can tell you one thing that will cause it to overheat. Uh, you go up if you go to Black Mountain, and, and you're over on the Harlan side, and you try going up that mountain, and it's real wet and muddy and sloppy, and you put it in four wheel high and you're spinning your wheels all the way up that mountain, your transmission will overheat. Um, that has taught me to use four wheel low a lot of times. Uh, I use it almost all the time if, if I'm if I'm off-roading uh, and need to put it in four wheel drive. So uh, now you answer from a educated standpoint, that was my experience standpoint. Yeah, most definitely. If you are traveling at slower speeds um, and you are running in four high, it will certainly make um, your automatic transmission overheat. And it can puke out. Once it overheats, it can puke out fluid if you're not careful, causing a fire. One of the most common ones we've seen in the past is um, running up and down the beach like the Outer Banks. 
and you're in four high while you're doing that um, and the transmission overheats. Another thing is not you don't really if you've got an automatic transmission want to run it in drive so it's constantly upshifting and downshifting upshifting and downshifting we want to run our automatic transmissions just like a manual we want to choose the gear and keep it in that gear and that'll help that automatic transmission not overheat and um, puke fluid because it's not shifting another thing to kind of think about is depending on your vehicle is there's probably a transmission cooler a lot of times they are built into the radiator um, I know at least in the Toyota world, they're built into the radiator, but you can also have an external one um, in front of the radiator possibly. But if that transmission cooler has mud or dirt caked into it, it's not going to be effective. Same thing if it's built into your radiator, it's not going to be effective. Very good. Okay, next question is another Jeep question. Go figure, right? The, uh, yeah. Are the brake lines, those flexible lines that go from your hard line to the wheel, the, the brake lines, do you know if those are uh, common on all, the uh, same size for all four corners? Can I carry one as a spare or do I have to go get four different lengths and blah, blah, blah? Um, I think the lengths are different. I, I know the diameter and size of it is the same um, yeah. front to rear for the vehicle. I'm not positive on Jeeps. I know on Toyotas, they are different lengths. And a lot of times um, they are built into a hard line. Um, so we can't just replace a flexible line. It'll have a union into a hard line. Um, so you're probably going to have to buy it either for the front or for the rear of the vehicle uh, to carry a replacement brake line. Okay. Um, I flashed this one on the screen because it's right there staring at me. And that's for you, Mike. Was that an Atlas tool roll? Yes, it is. This is a tool roll by Atlas 46 um, that I've got right here. Um, I carry two of them. Uh, one is for my field expedient repair kit, and then one is for my tools. I found these to be, as of right now, I found these to be the best tool rolls um, for me, right? There's tons of them out there, but man, I can pack some stuff into these and they roll up nice and tight and it's easy to move around. And in a pinch, I will lay on it because I don't like being in the mud. <laughs> and and they make them in yellow. They, yeah. Yeah. All right. Our next question from uh, Jason Mercer. Would pulley size change output? So I'm, I'm guessing that with that uh, pulley size change output, that would be talking about the alternator. I don't believe it will. It's definitely not on newer vehicles. Uh, maybe on older style vehicles with the generator style alternators. but um, with newer ones, they have a voltage regulator that's going to control that voltage. You can put a bigger alternator on a lot of vehicles. I know, you know, that was a big thing in the Jeep world back in the day is putting a high output um, alternator on your vehicle. A lot of vehicles like my Ram 2500, we specifically bought the camper package. So it has a heavier duty alternator on it that puts out more amperage um, into the charging system for us. So. Uh, I don't think, especially not on newer ones, that a pulley would help out with that. Um, I just got a message from Al. The power went off at his house, so oh no. Um, uh, so he told us to wrap it up and you know, etc. Et so I don't know if there are other questions. We can we can continue with questions. I think we've got uh, one more. Oh, this one was from Holly Slade Boomer. Can we talk about different fire extinguishers in one episode? Most definitely. Um, I think fire extinguishers and some of the safety products, maybe even work that into uh, fire extinguishers and maybe a first aid kit. We can get someone on to really talk about that a little bit. That would be a great tech net episode because um, there are different fire extinguishers out there and they all do different stuff um, with with uh, with your kind of vehicle system. So what type of fire extinguisher you carry is super important. But um, I think that's our last question. So again, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, thank you guys for supporting this TechNet. All of you said, you know, at Dixie Run, you couldn't wait for it to come back on board. So we're cranking it back up. As Al said, we're going to be sharing them about once every other week. Um, this particular season has three episodes total, including this one, and it's all about tools. The guys from SunX Tools will be with us at Clemson Four Wheel Drive the week after Thanksgiving. So week after next, 
and we will be shooting right at Clemson Four Wheel Drive. So make sure you go and like their Facebook page and SunX, S-U-N-E-X, tools for um, helping us out and supporting the tech net with this. And uh, tune in for that one because it's going to be pretty cool. I never knew there was so much science that went into tools. You know, I was like, ah, it's a ratchet. It's so simple. Or a socket. It's so simple. Well, they've kind of educated me a little bit about it. And it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, and then we're going to have Cole that you guys probably remember from one of our tech nets uh, jump on. And he's going to talk about using specific tools and kind of when and where he uses them on the trail and in the shop. So tune in, guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much, Mike, Al. Y'all do a fabulous job. I want to shout out again to BFG and Warren for um, taking care of everybody who is watching. Well, thank you guys again. Make sure, like, share, tell your mom, dad, aunts, uncles, dogs, hairdresser, tell everybody. Uh, but thanks for tuning in, guys.